of Avonlea. The dramatic series charts the trials and tribulations of the King family, who live in Victorian Canada. Inhabited by a well-seasoned ensemble cast, Avonlea also serves as a home away from home for an impressive list of guest talent, including Ned Beatty. Well, no, no, this is it. This is the latest thing. This is what we're selling, you know. I mean, this is, this is your new yeah, improved yeah. one and only. Oh, yeah, we can't buy it anywhere else. This is a new bootskate. Yeah. The fellow I'm playing is a traveling salesman. Uh, it sells uh, skates, comes from Chicago. His name of his company, company is the Windy City Skate Company. He meets and falls in love with the lovely Hetty King, mostly because uh, <clears throat> he sees her feet. <laughs> it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a feet thing. It's all about feet for him. He can size people up by looking at their feet. Aha, now you see, a nice high arch like this shows creativity, artistic temperament. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, and if you find uh, the toes just even, well, that's a straight shooter, honest as the day is long. And then we've got uh, lots of uh, corns and calluses, uh, other disruptions. Well, that's a pinch personality. Somebody who has a life full of worry, whoa. Oh, but to tell you the God's truth, Mr. Higgins, I never thought about my feet in that way. <laughs> Because we're going to be loose on them, you know. So maybe even a bit more just to make no, sure no, we see the business? No, I think that be because you're doing a show like uh, Rhodes Avenue, it, it's, as I said, it's a, lot, it's a lot like the Merchant Ivory uh, Productions or uh, British Masterpiece Theater. Just, it's a little more theatrical than most, and uh, the look is really very incredibly important. The lighting, the wardrobe, uh, that's really what you're going for. And so as a director, you, you make your shots a lot more complicated and bigger than what you know, most normal television. And, and the, the, yeah. Up. Yeah. the crew we have on Avonlea is a top, probably one of the best crews I've ever worked with anywhere. In some sets there's a lot of practical joking and this is not like that. I think it's because it's kind of a theatrical piece. Again, you're working with a lot of uh, actors that were trained in the theater, really people that are, you know, and so they've got a very solid uh, acting background. They approach the role very seriously. I mean, people really come in and do their job. Okay. My, my father's big belief was that if you had a short upper lip, a uh, short length here, that you were a criminal. Ned is really terrific. He's got a, um, he's very focused. He comes on the set and he loosens everybody up right away by making jokes and walking around. And, and it, so you wonder, you watch him. When I first watched him work, I, I, you know, I was curious to see how he approached the role. And that's his way of relaxing, is by trying out a lot of different things and kibitzing with the crew and everything. But as you get closer and closer to rolling, he refines it until by the time you shoot, he's absolutely focused. Yeah. 5-150, take one marker. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Frank. No. No. Have you heard this? Did you hear about the elephant that quit his job at the factory? No, mercy sake, why'd he do that? He was tired of working for peanuts. <laughs> for Beatty, Defining his skate-selling character was as easy as dusting off the old family album. I thought a lot about my dad. My dad was a traveling salesman. Um, my dad, God bless him, <laughs> sold one of the most difficult things I've ever heard of anybody selling. This is when I was a little boy. And he used to go, he was away basically a week at a time. And what he sold was he sold fire hydrants. Now, you don't just sell one fire hydrant. You, when you, you sell fire hydrants, you've got to sell them, you know, to the whole city, and they've got to put in so many and so many locks on it. So my dad had this really tough selling job. So I, and all these memories have been flooding back, and I've used them a lot in, in this show. Oh, my father was a salesman. My uncle. My uncle had a wonderful selling life. He, he sold something they call remembrance advertising, which is all little matchbooks and playing cards, anything the business would have their name on it that they would give away. That's what oh, he sold. Right. And he sold it in one of the poorest parts of the United States, United, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, Tennessee, all the mountain areas. Oh. And uh, he was quite the guy. Feet are the windows of the soul, ladies. Don't say. <laughs> no, window of the soul. Yes, yes. Don't be dull. <laughs> Now, as much fun as I've been having here, I do have another customer to visit. Oh. So if you ladies will <clears throat> forgive me, Mrs. Lawson, I'll come by in the morning and uh, and pick up the oh. orders, okay? Oh, thank you. Oh, here we are. <laughs>
Toodaloo, ladies. Oh. Keep smiling. <laughs> All right, then, ladies. What about these orders? <laughs> Cut. That was great. <laughs> what a good take. <laughs> what the heck? The heck with the rest of it. I got the door locked. <laughs> Welcome back to E's Half Hour Look at the Disney Channel's Avonlea. In addition to a large cast of veteran performers, Avonlea plays home to a handful of child actors. I think the great thing about, you know, being a kid on this is anywhere else, you know, you're kind of given this whole put on by adults, but here, you know, you really get treated like an equal and it's it's har sometimes hard to you know live up to that that challenge but it's a it's a really satisfying feeling to to know you know you're thought of as an equal so you can finish your line nice and strong here because otherwise you're going to finish and they had to kind of shuffle in it then it'll carry the energy in here a little more okay i have three sons and uh, i guess it helps being a father because when you're a director you know you're our father to everybody on the set and you're a psychologist you're everything and sometimes you have to be strict and yell at them and sometimes but you know that's just what that's what makes a director is to handle all these kids because i like them i respect what they do it's really hard you know they, they come in here and there's all and because this is a more verbal show than most so you get these kids that are 9 10 11 years old doing you know half page speeches and three and four page masters and they're right on their marks and they're eating sandwiches and drinking tea and all that they're, it's really fantastic how good they are might drop his lawsuit if he thought you were promised to another man. <laughs> Probably would. <laughs> oh, Felicity King, where'd you get such an idea? <laughs> well, I've made a considerable study on these situations. Men are very competitive. You could use one man against the other to get what you want. Oh, and they are also ruled by their stomachs. <laughs> competitive? <laughs> ruled by their stomachs? <laughs> Tell me more. Well, I've also noticed that they like to... Cut. I don't know what <laughs> well, I've worked on some things where the crew have been really rotten. They just haven't been nice to one another. They haven't been nice to the cast. But this crew, I find every single person is really friendly. Now, nice shuttle. Fred's kind of a pass. <laughs> That's my open eye. Where is the camera? <laughs> All right. Let's go. Come on, I'm ready. I'm darting for the Gemini's. Stand by, please. I'll never fit into my dress. The most unlikely cast crew friendship is found between child actor Zach Bennett and production manager Joe Boccia. Yeah. Were you in that show? With him? No, I was there because Sarah and I were going to Cedric's Cottage. So I talked to him there. Yes. You were Cedric's Cottage. I'm going. You were in it, you were in it any, any, No, not just Sarah. No. You weren't in any of the scenes of Green Gable? No. Not in that show? I wasn't in that show at all. Maybe it's because I, I got younger brothers. Maybe I can relate. I don't know. He's always sitting behind the set, so that's it's that's our friendship. Of, that's our friendship. We just it's, like to make each other laugh. It's like nothing uh, wrong with laughing. Rehearsing, right? seeing him over there, and seeing me over here, like hi, and I was just doing funny things and watching him. Or sometimes I, I try to make him <laughs> be a business guy. Sometimes I try to make him laugh when he's not supposed to. All these kids come up to me and go like, "He must be. Oh, I'm gonna be in your job. No, you don't." Know. <laughs> Yes, I do. No, you don't, you know. It's kind of like, it's not bad. But to think of some of my friends, I'm trying to, how would they cope with that? Every break I have, I basically shoot up to school and get as much work I can, as I can. But I find, like, I get behind and then I get ahead and it's kind of like racing, you know. It's much, much harder. Like, it's, it's, not, the, it's not as easy as it sounds. And um, Mac and Sarah. And Teddy, could you please tell them this? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, well, no, don't take it out. You look pretty that way. Now, so Teddy, I'm a plain woman. No, you're not. You still have admirers. Look at Mr. Higgins. Higgins, Higgins, Higgins. I wish the women in this family stop badgering me about Ronnie Higgins. I was just excited for you. When you read a scene, you know, the night before, you have a total image of what it's going to look like and where it's going to be. And you never can think otherwise. And usually, you know, when people change it, it's like, I don't know about this, you know, this. But when Jackie, it's, she totally changes it. And she's really quite, you know, 
brilliant and imaginative. I think it's the influence of having kids around. So it's not about stars or acting or... I guess it's about acting, but it's not about... You know, it's all kind of... Everybody communicates pretty well and pretty relaxed with each other, and it's been going on for a while. So it's really a community. It feels like a community, and we've had the same crew, and it's all very close. I think also because the children are there, you know, you're... There's something about it, you know, they, they're just living their lives. They're not always acting, right? So there's a kind of... It's really gentle. <laughs> Welcome back to E's Half Hour Look at the Disney Channel's Avonlea. In order to create the perfect turn-of-the-century environment, director Stuart Gillard gets by with a little help from the crew. Well, first of all, you're in a great set, so that helps you. I mean, if, when you're in this kind of dressing right away as a director, it helps you block it. So when I come in to do it, I always uh, walk all the sets because... You know, there's the old stoves are around, the old pumps over the sink, and uh, all of those things give you ideas on how to stage the scene, so it's a little different than a modern piece. You can think of business that the actors could do that they could do here that could never be done in 1992. You know, that right away, that helps you. And, action. Wellington. Oh, my humble apologies, Wellington. Uh, truly, it was an accident. I, oh, will you accept this, this plum cake as a token of my... I don't want cake. I want $250 and I want you to leave. Oh, now, Wellington, please. I think uh, mostly it's just to try and get it as close to the time period that they want to play the, uh, the show in. And I guess the best way to do it for this particular show because it's the turn of the century and photography was invented already they used to try and find books that have photographs from the period and also books that would be from the area that we're shooting looking for um, what the people wore or uh, what the furniture looked like what was on the walls how they put things on the walls the wallpapers um, I try and look at see what the wallpapers looked like at the, in the period, but sometimes it's really hard to find contemporary wallpapers that are of the color range. You know, it's not Victorian, it's sort of um, getting out of the Victorian period and moving into the Edwardian period in terms of uh, look, I think, because it doesn't have the clutter that the Victorian has. Hetty, you can't just hide under there for the rest of your life. Oh, yes, I can. Y you have to get up and face things. No, I don't. Let's shoot. There's a sense that you absolutely have to come into alignment with the period because of what you're wearing. You can't misrepresent it, you know. So I find, like, even now I'm noticing <laughs> I'm speaking quite crisply. You know, I don't do that when I'm not wearing this kind of a neckline and, you know, the corset that I'm wearing, you know. You can feel those bones, you know. Do you know in the old days, they, um, women who couldn't afford whalebone would wear um, um, steel bones in their corsets, and because they would get hot, the steel would rust, and eventually it would break, and it would poke them, and they would die. So, of course, the king women wear whalebone because we don't want any premature deaths in Avonlea. They're, they're really tight and boned and so held in, and so lunch is kind of a problem. And lying down, if you go for a rest, you have to keep your head up so that your, your hair doesn't get messed. And you have to keep, and the, and the, so you have to put your feet up like this, and lie with your back flat on them. And like that. It's very, it's, it takes years of practice. You can't lift your arms very high because they're tight around the shoulders. I mean, it's nothing like what we wear today at all. And then in the summertime, it's really warm because we've got, like, tights and these and this and this and layers after layers and everything. We produce, uh, as I say, a complete costume a day. It worked out to last year in this shop. Because we're doing Victorian work, we're trying to reproduce the clothing to be as appropriate to the Victorian times as possible. And uh, here in the background, we've got Graham cutting away. And without him cutting, we wouldn't end up with this finished product. And, of course, then in between his capable hands, there are 
the hands of Carl and Lorene, our sewers, and Franz, our milliner. And uh, everyone makes an equal contribution to the end product here. So myself, without the help of all of these skilled people, would be, I'd be looking for another job. <laughs> well, let's see how this is fitting, Jackie. That's right, except this funny thing. You know, like somebody else's hip got in there. Well, I think it just needs to be redraped right through the waistline. I and know, but you know when the, the, when the belt comes in and this... Kira, do you want to get yeah. this? We have the actors and actresses come in for fittings. And in the case of like someone like Jackie, for example, who is like on camera a huge amount of time, we tend to just work from her measurements and I'll do a design and we'll make it up and send it out and then she'll go, oh, this is different or this is wrong or we don't let, you know, can right. you change this? And we sort of do that. Well, the styling is, is slightly different than, uh, well, England or the States, for example. And in the fact that this is Prince Edward Island, it's a lot more, well, we're simple people, as we like to say. Okay, yeah, so I'll obviously come. we have a belt that covers this waistband, as we explained earlier, which is yeah. essentially a finished strip of buckram. And uh, we tend to hang all the skirts on that, and it also offers a nice hard waistline that, mm -hmm. and, and the least bulk of the waist possible. And the corset, of course, changes the, the line. Like, if you don't wear a corset, you can really tell. You know, That's I mean, right. It, no matter how good your posture is, it's about, it's sort of... It's an attitude. It's like a pigeon, yeah. kind of that, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it like creates a real pigeon. attitude, too. Yeah. Just physically, people, it, it, it establishes a posture that you can't try and fake really well without a corset. Okay. Thank you. So, and, and this is a, a period closure. The hooks and eyes. They used a hook and eye all the way down the back. Thankfully, modern production has come up with putting it on tape so that we don't have to sew each individual little one in now. Oh, which, right. Yeah, which, which is a benefit, but yeah. it still is correct. And they did, in yeah. fact, develop this toward the end. Yeah. The corset? And so it has a corset. And the corset now, Jackie tends down. to wear her corset a little lower than everybody else because she likes it that Usually they go way. right up. Yeah. And they come up usually over the bust. And this, do you see this thing? This and then the this is the bum pad that we're talking about. And uh, this is kind of a little one that's kind of flattened out because Jackie's very slim and we like a kind of linear look on her and she feels comfortable that way. Yeah. And uh, so this but, goes uh, underneath. Yeah, and then my this name is how the course it is adjusted <laughs> so that you can make people with that little tiny wasp waist that you always associate with the period. And, uh, and so they, in fact, tighten the strings through the back here. And the old story of the man with his knee in the middle of the back hauling away on the mm. strings is completely true. In fact, um, it should be that tight. Yeah, but, but once again, she's so slim it hardly... I had a coat on today. So that's right. Okay. She's yeah. getting away with murder. So that's really it. Yeah. Short of my own underwear. <laughs> it's not that interesting. <laughs> Welcome back to E's half-hour look at the Disney Channel's Avonlea. The Avonlea series may be shot in the Great White North, but the temperature on the set is far from frigid. It's a pretty friendly set, for one thing. Um, I think people here like each other. I think they have a fairly good working condition. I think they're very happy that this show is here. Certainly nothing about my private life. You never told me. You let me on. You accepted the chocolates. You accepted the skates. <sighs> I picked, no, that's not right. You accepted the skates and you were engaged and to You were engaged, to, and all the time you were engaged to him. I picked a lemon in the garden of love. That was it. Canadians very often find themselves feeling a bit like second-class Americans, which is a, a damnable shame because I, Canada is one of my favorite com countries on the face of the earth. I, I love it here. I like coming here. I picked a lemon in the garden of love. This is such a strange line, but I didn't want to cut I it love it. in the world. I love that line. I wouldn't line. have cut it for nothing in the world. Perfect. It is a great one. This is, you know, this... And Hetty is sort of a lemon. This reminds me of my dad. My dad a was lemon. a very Victorian person. Yeah. He wrote poems. He was a salesman. He used to send my mother poems on the road. And when, and he, my, my mother named me William Day Beatty, which I think is a lovely name. Yeah. And she even made out the announcement she gave my father to mail. And he was going off on a business trip. And he swore that he kept them in his pocket too long. They all stuck together. He had to throw them away because he wanted to name me Ned. <laughs> and it, you know, it's, really, it's very sweet because he wrote this wonderful poem okay. to my mother about naming me Ned. All actors are storytellers. Almost universally, actors will tell you stories. I wish she'd have told him the story about I wish to land, and then they have to say, I don't wish to keep you from your Canadian wife. <laughs> 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 
And, um, of course, you see, Jeff's had some problems because he was thrown in jail in East Berlin and in Paris. Oh, well, they're, they're right about him. He ought to be in it. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. and he was thrown in jail in South Africa. Even more reasons to be in that. Way. Well, no wonder they won't let him into our fine country. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping I like doing this show. I've, I've had a good time with it. And I, there, there's a small thing which could bring my character back, and I'm kind of hoping that it will. It's a there's a wedding uh, there's an engagement ring involved and it was quite a lot of money that my character paid for it and we've lost it in the snow so i'm ha I sneakily i'm kind of hoping that when the spring thaws come <laughs> they'll find this engagement ring and maybe i'll come back for another go or something behind the scenes behind the scenes behind the scenes